Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Afghanistan is facing a dire human rights emergency. This is deteriorating by the day. Since the fall of Kabul in August, the Taliban have threatened fundamental rights and freedoms with women, girls, and civil society among those most affected. A new UN AMA report shows the escalation of extrajudicial killings and disappearance of former government employees and detention of women's rights activists and journalists including ethnic and religious minorities. Peaceful Protesters have been beaten, threatened, harassed, and the Taliban authorities have imposed wide-ranging restrictions on media and free speech. Several women's rights defenders and leading peacemakers have been targeted, and there is a widespread fear of reprisals since a violent crackdown on women's protests in January. Such abuses and violations often occur with impunity. This is the situation in Afghanistan and it is current and ongoing and needs to be addressed. The UN AMA um, formed a meeting and we're going to listen to some of, of what happened over the next hour to two hours as we listen to them, them talking about the conditions of, in Afghanistan for those who stand for women, for freedoms, and against the Taliban. Your Excellencies, welcome to today's critical convening, upholding women's rights as human rights in Afghanistan, an urgent moment for Yanama renewal. I'm Milan Revere, and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and I'm pleased to be able to moderate today's event, along with our co-hosts, the United Kingdom and Qatar, on behalf of the Group of Friends of Women in Afghanistan, UN Women, our institute, and the co-sponsors, the permanent missions of the United States, Canada, Ireland, France, and Indonesia. Thank you to those of you joining us here at the United Nations and for the many who are joining us virtually from around the world. We come together at a profoundly difficult moment for the world that calls for even greater international cooperation. Many are working day and night to address the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine, a tragedy that threatens many of the values we hold dear, freedom, democracy, territorial integrity, and more. We are grappling with the unprovoked invasion of a peaceful nation, a flagrant violation of international law, and an unfolding humanitarian catastrophe that demands the full attention of the international community 
and includes a special focus on women and girls who face their own specific challenges. And I would like to acknowledge the representative from the government of Ukraine here today. We come together to draw attention at this session to the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan, which continues to deteriorate. It holds grave consequences for global and regional security, and it is imperative that the United Nations lead the way in advancing effective international action. Afghanistan is facing a grave human rights crisis on top of an unprecedented humanitarian emergency with especially severe consequences for women and girls. Peaceful protesters have been threatened and harshly punished. Women's rights activists and journalists have been detained and the Taliban authorities have imposed wide ranging restrictions on media and free speech. Afghan women continue to stand up against the Taliban rule in defense of their hard earned rights. Shortly we will hear from Afghan women leaders now living in exile to discuss the ongoing human rights crisis in their country, as well as hear their call for a more effective and urgent response. It is now my distinct pleasure to give the floor to Her Royal Highness, Sophie Countess of Wessex, a longtime advocate for women and girls, particularly on issues of women in peace and security. Your Royal Highness. Thank you, Milan, and thank you very much for this opportunity just to make a very few brief remarks before we get to hear the, have the opportunity to hear from our Afghan briefers, which is what we're here to do. Last week, I met an Afghan translator who left Afghanistan in 2014 and who now lives in the United Kingdom with his wife and family. He's still in touch with family and friends in Afghanistan and he was almost in tears as he told me what life is there, like there now. While the men in his family have suffered at the hands of the Taliban, it is the women in his family who can only step foot outside if they are accompanied by a male relative for whom he fears the most. Most of them dare not even go out of their houses at all, terrified of being taken, abused or worse. He is frightened for so many women and girls who have now become virtual prisoners in their own homes. Life has regressed, yet the Taliban would have us believe that they are allowing citizens to go about their normal activities. We know that this is not true. So while we welcome their announcement that they have committed to reopening schools to girls this month and the return of some women to university, what we know is that the rights of women and girls have worsened and Afghanistan is facing a desperate humanitarian and economic crisis and that there is severe food insecurity. It is so hard to imagine how much has changed for so many in so little time. Where once there was hope with women playing a central role in society, there is now hunger, destitution and violence. And now our attention is at risk of being diverted from Afghanistan with the devastating invasion of Ukraine by its Russian neighbor. But while our focus has naturally turned to these events, the crisis in Afghanistan has not gone away and the effects are worsening daily. So what can we do to help the women and girls of Afghanistan? How can we support the brave women peace builders and activists and all those who have stood up to the Taliban to demand their rights while risking their lives in doing so? How do we ensure that the international community remains involved and engaged with the issues that Afghanistan is facing? These are difficult questions to answer, but I hope by hearing directly from those on the ground as to what the main priorities are and what can be done, we can move some of these critical points forward. I'd like to thank you all for coming together today and I look forward to hearing from you as you respond to the briefings we are about to hear and recommit our support for the women and girls and people of Afghanistan. Thank you, Milan. 
Thank you so much, Your Royal Highness, and thank you for your compelling remarks and your dedication to this issue. We're going to turn now to uh, the Honorable Rosemary DiCarlo, the United Nations Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first let me thank the group of Friends of Women of Afghanistan, particularly the co-chairs, Qatar and the United Kingdom, as well as the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security and UN Women for organizing today's event. To say this event is timely is an understatement. A week ago today, the world marked International Women's Day, but the wor around the world we see the erosion of the rights of women and girls. In Afghanistan, the current situation women and girls are facing is most concerning. Over the seven months since the Taliban seized power, women's fundamental rights and freedoms, the fruit of 20 years of struggle, have been drastically rolled back. On International Women's Day, the de facto authorities reiterated their commitment to, and I quote, addressing the plight of Afghan women in light of the noble religion of Islam and our accepted traditions, end quote. However, women leaders, human rights defenders, activists, journalists continue to be intimidated, forcibly disappeared, arbitrarily arrested, and sometimes killed. Women and girls have been sidelined from public and political life. Their attire, movement, and voices are subject to policing and surveillance. I saw firsthand when I visited Afghanistan in July 2019 the enthusiasm of Afghan women as they prepared to support and participate in the peace process. The women I met were ready and eager to play a role in their country's future. When I returned to Afghanistan in December 2021, I witnessed a very different landscape with many women fearing to leave their homes. The de facto authorities have taken some welcome steps, such as the reopening of universities. A week from today, schools are to reopen across the country. We need to hold the de facto authorities to their word to enable girls to be educated and insist that girls of all ages are able to return to the classroom. Various broader challenges further compound the difficulties women and girls face. The humanitarian crisis, economic contraction, and shrinking civic space all risk exacerbating existing inequalities. Women, children, minority populations, and other vulnerable groups could be left even further behind. Excellencies, the current mandate of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan is about to end. On Thursday, the Security Council is scheduled to vote on a new resolution that takes into account the current realities. As the Secretary General recommended to the Security Council in January, an integrated special political mission with a robust mandate in good offices, human rights, and the coordination and facilitation of assistance remains critical. The guiding principle of our presence is to support the Afghan people. It is important that the special political mission be empowered to support inclusive dialogue with the focus to promote participatory governance. It is also critical for the mission to have a robust human rights monitoring and advocacy role. This is particularly pertinent for the advancement of the women, peace, and security agenda, and to help bring about tangible improvements in the lives of women, girls, and all Afghans. Likewise, the coordination of humanitarian assistance to meet basic needs, particularly among the most vulnerable, including women and children, is essential. We also need to facilitate opportunities for civil society to directly and safely engage with the de facto authorities. This is especially important in light of the repression of activists and human rights defenders. Today's meeting is an excellent opportunity for us to hear directly from Afghan women about their needs, hopes, and aspirations for the future of Afghanistan. We value their insights about how the UN and the international community can work together to uphold women's rights in the country and enhance women's participation. 
I look forward to today's discussion and to ensuring that our collective actions meet the moment. For over 20 years, these courageous women have fought for their rights. We have a responsibility to support them as they claim their rightful space to shape the future. Thank you. Thank you, Under Secretary General DiCarlo, um, and certainly for referencing the importance of the UNAMA mandate renewal, as well as the critical need to monitor human rights violations, which I'm sure we're going to hear more about. We're going to turn now to Her Excellency, the permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the United Nations, Ambassador Woodward. Well, Ambassador Vavir, Your Royal Highness, thank you. Uh, for highlighting why our commitment to women and girls in Afghanistan is so important. And I'm especially delighted and honoured that we're joined today uh, by uh, our Afghan friends and panellists. And now, as the Under Secretary General was saying, is a crucial moment to renew that commitment ahead of the UNAMA mandate renewal this week and the Afghanistan pledging conference at the end of this month. In a complex space, I think there are three areas which require our particular attention. First is the protection of women and girls. The allegations of targeted killings, disappearances, detention of women protesters, suppression of women's voices across Afghanistan are gravely concerning. Secondly, girls' education. We're encouraged to see the return of some women to university. But the opening of schools on the 21st of March is a crucial moment, and the world will be watching to ensure the Taliban live up to their commitment to girls' education. Thirdly, participation. Afghan women have played a vital role in the development of modern Afghanistan, as politicians, legislators, businesswomen, doctors, nurses, teachers, judges, lawyers, journalists, artists. And it is essential that all Afghan women have the opportunity to participate fully in public life and contribute to the development of their country and our society. So for the UK's part, we're working with the Security Council to ensure the UNAMA mandate includes strong human rights and gender components. Uh, we're also working with the OHCHR to protect Afghan human rights defenders. The UK is co-hosting the Afghanistan Pledging Conference on the 31st of March, and we have already doubled humanitarian funding to over $370 million this year, and we've worked with the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank to release further funds. And we will be urging the wider donor community to step up its support. And we remain committed through our co-chairing of this group of friends uh, to championing Afghan women's voices like those of our briefers today. So I look forward to hearing more from them on how we can address these challenges and together build a brighter future for Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Woodward, and I think the call for urgent protection, education, and participation uh, really is of the moment. We're going to turn now to Rina Amiri, the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghan Women, Girls, and Human Rights. Rina. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Milan. Georgetown uh, Institute of uh, Women, Peace and Security, the Group of Friends of Women in Afghanistan, UN Women, the UK, and the Qatar Mission to the UN. Uh, I want to particularly thank you for keeping the spotlight on Afghan women. We should be able to do more than one thing at a time. And the situation of Afghan women is not only important from a normative perspective, but from a moral perspective and a strategic perspective. The, uh, Afghanistan is not simply going to slip into the background. We have over 40 years of history to demonstrate 
that the uh, situation in Afghanistan, if it's left to uh, simply uh, decline, it will bleed out into the region, into Europe, and into the U.S. It is a, a situation that has to be seen within that light. So we are not looking to Afghanistan and the situation of Afghan women as uh, those of victims, but those of agents, those of leaders, and those that are strategic players and, uh, and the issues that are vital to our own security interests, our own uh, values that, that we uh, uphold within this chamber. Um, we uh, have expressed voice to, to the values that these individuals that are sitting at this table have been fighting for their entire life. And it is incumbent upon us to continue being standing behind these voices. Um, I also uh, want to note that the important role that the UN UNAMA has played in Afghanistan, it has been the home, one of the addresses for human rights in Afghanistan and must continue to be an address for human rights in Afghanistan, not just in the capital, but throughout Afghanistan and has to be sufficiently supported to maintain that role. Uh, I also welcome the appointment of the UN Special Rapporteur for Afghanistan and note that it, it will be absolutely critical for the, uh, the Special Rapporteur to be able to go to Afghanistan in order to make the assessments and to talk to Afghans directly. The issue, you know, one of the lessons that we should uh, bear in mind is in the course of the last 20 years, we uh, have learned that peace before justice doesn't work. Humanitarian before justice doesn't work. It is all integrated. It, we must do many difficult things at the same time. And that's why the, the voices uh, of, of the, these women leaders are going to be critical to tell us and the priorities that we have identified on education. It is encouraging that the Taliban have noted that they are going to um, uh, put some steps forward to enabling girls to go back to school. But how that's done, um, and just the, the, uh, the minutia of how that has to happen in order to be meaningful, that is up to Afghans to tell us how to do it how education um, needs to be linked to employment in order to be meaningful. That is something else that I've heard from them time and again, and it's something that we need to hear and that we need to reflect in our own policies. And on the, the situation of the human rights, uh, the, the devastating situation inside the country, we need to speak in concrete terms, not just in terms of condemning it, but what are the measures that we need to, as, as the international community, uh, stand behind and and uh, and work to put in place um, uh, and uh, and advocate for um, the u s uh, government stands behind these women. Uh, my office has been established in, or in order to focus exactly on the voices that are here and in Afghanistan. And I thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you, Rena, and thank you for reminding us that this is truly a moral and strategic issue. Uh, we're going to turn now to the Deputy Perm Rep of Qatar, uh, Sharifa, please. Thank you so much. The state of Qatar is delighted to uh, co-sponsor and co-host this uh, event uh, with the permit missions of uh, UK, UN Women, and the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace, and Security. We underscore our strong support for UNAMA and, UN and its work in promoting full, equal, and meaningful participation of a woman in all aspects of public life. We thank the Special Representative, Ms. Deborah Leon, for her work and commitment. We have underscored uh, our, uh, the need for and urgency for international community to work with Afghan, uh, uh, with Afghan caretaker government to address the multitude of humanitarian, economic security and human rights challenges facing the country. Therefore, we support the active engagement between the care, caretaker government and UNAMA. Qatar welcomed the UN Security Council Resolution 2615 in December of last year, providing uh, for humanitarian exemption to the sanctions regime established by Resolution 1899 of 2011, enabling the provisions of, uh, human, of, uh, of humanitarian aid to Afghanistan as the country uh, bears of economic, economic collapse. Uh, um, 
to further our uh, commitment to Afghanistan, we will be co-hosting with the UK and Germany the high-level pledging conference uh, event for humanitarian response in Afghanistan in uh, 2022, scheduled to be held on uh, 21st of March. The state of Qatar remains uh, firmly in support of UNAMA and its mission. We welcome the Secretary General recommendation of UNAMA's strategic objectives and priorities moving forward included in his uh, report of 28 January 2022. We joined other requesting an uh, expansion of the empowered mandate and sufficient resources of UNAMA and on the need uh, to maintain a focus on peace uh, by leveraging humanitarian and development efforts, especially delivery of essential services such as health and education, community and uh, infrastructure, and to promote of livelihood and social cohesion with a special emphasis on the social economic needs of women and girls. In conclusion, let me reaffirm that the state of Qatar has long-term uh, com commitment to support the Afghan people on their path towards uh, sustaining peace, economic, and social prosperity in close collaboration with national, regional, and international partners. We are working to preserve a future for the Afghan people and to ensure women, girls, and youth are part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much and for reminding us about the incredible commitment that your government continues to make. Thank you. We're now going to turn to the most important speakers here today, our panel of Afghan women leaders. And we're going to begin with Horia Masadiq, who is a widely respected human rights defender from Afghanistan. She leads the Safety and Risk Mitigation Organization a local NGO that works to keep women safe and secure, especially in these very difficult times. She has extensive experience working with human rights defenders at risk and has led countrywide efforts to provide protection. Horia, welcome, and we're eager to hear from you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the Georgetown University and Madam Ambassador Malen Vervier and her team for inviting us to this event. And I would like to thank the United Nations for having us here. Dear Excellencies, I'm thankful to all of you for remembering Afghanistan as one of the other crises to the Ukraine. While the misfortunate events of Ukraine and invasion of Russia is dominating international media and debate, I am really grateful that you also remember Afghanistan. Thank you. I am here to speak about the situation of Afghanistan, a country that just a few months ago fell to the Taliban as a result of collective failure of our own government as well as the international community. The country fell to a group that several years ago, United Nations recognized it as a terrorist group and put many of its senior members on the international sanction list and asset freeze and travel ban. Since Taliban took over in August 15, 2021, hundreds of thousands of Afghans, mostly professional and educated, were forced to leave the country or flee, particularly women in horror of reprisal against them. While the number of attacks against women rights and human rights defenders, journalists, and civilians stand at its highest, Women were abducted, disappeared, detained, tortured, and forced into confession simply because they were peacefully demonstrating and asking for their fundamental rights, such as right to education, employment, and political participation. The number of extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances, arbitrary detention, and torture is at its highest particularly against former members of the Afghan government who laid down their weapons and started a life of civilian. Many journalists were detained, tortured, and for covering a peaceful demonstration or inviting a Taliban critic on their TV show. Restrictions that Taliban impose on women is not seen anywhere in Islamic world, even not 1,400 years ago when Islam emerged. Taliban have taken the gender apartheid to another level, where women and girls are de denied from their fundamental rights, such as education, employment, and social and economic rights. 
while under the pressure from the international community, they allowed girls to go to the university under a strict segregation and dress code regime. But what education means when, you are not pro when there are no prospects for employment and contribution to the social economic sphere of, this, of their society. Crackdown on critics, civil rights protesters, members of the former government, whom to whom search and seizure operations of the Taliban, terrorizing families, ransacking, vandalizing, and confiscating personal properties of the people under the name of home search operation or new tactics, the Taliban, and continuation of their decades-long pattern of violence and reprisal against Afghans, particularly women leaders, which have only escalated in the past six months. In the current climate of horror, and despair when the majority of human rights organizations are not able to operate inside Afghanistan and in absence of key institutions such as Ministry of Women's Affairs that was mostly dealing with the women rights issues and Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, the presence of an entity such as UNAMA, particularly Human Rights Unit is key. I call on the UN Security Council and other members of the United Nations to please renew the mandate of UNAMA with a human rights-based approach. We are human rights of women and historically marginalized and vulnerable ethnic and religious groups are not traded nor violations tempered down in engaging with the Taliban. We recognize that UNAMA to engage with the Taliban on both political and logistical level. We also recognize that the security of UNAMA staff and wider UN family and uh, Afghan and international partners is considerably impacted by the Taliban. Yet the preeminent UN entity operation in Afghanistan and as a body created by the Security Council, we fully expect UNAMA to fill the vacuum created by the absence of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission and other national and international organizations after 15th of August to independently and impartially report monitor, investigate, and report regularly on the human rights violations committed in Afghanistan. I end my presentation by some recommendations. UNAMA must regularly and effectively consult with Afghan civil society on all issues impacting Afghanistan and its future. This includes consultation with women rights and human rights defenders and journalists, not only with as selected members. UNAMA must adopt a comprehensive, holistic approach to women and girls' rights when engaging with the Taliban so that these rights are not carved up or sequenced or used as a political tool to exercise leverage with the Taliban. UNAMA must regularly update the Security Council in verbal and written briefings on the human rights situation of Afghanistan, including monitoring of the detention centers and prisons, including the ones run by the Taliban intelligence service, situation of women and girls, freedom of expression, association, and assembly. And last but not least, we would like the international community, whenever you engage with the Taliban, please make sure that your engagements are conditional. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Horia, and thank you for the recommendations on um, why the human rights components and the UNAMA mandate renewal are so critical going together. Uh, we're going to turn now to Fatima Faizi. She is an Afghan journalist with the New York Times and a leading voice for the rights of female journalists in Afghanistan and around the world. She has reported for several news outlets as well, and she aims to tell the stories of people who are silenced by the government in situations of conflict. As a recent evacuee, Fatima now holds a fellowship at Columbia University's School of Journalism. Welcome, Fatima. Thank you so much for having us. Today, I'm here to urge you to show solidarity with Afghans, with Afghan women, Afghan men, and Afghan children. And there is one way to do this. Please do not legitimize the Taliban. I'm here to tell you that despite the announcement of general amnesty, when the Kabul fell to the Taliban, the group are committing acts of reprisal and revenge against Afghans every day Men, women, and even children are being abducted, detained, subject to torture, 
sexual violence hanged off the back of the cranes and even made to give forced confessions for the crime they have not committed. More than a hundred former Afghan security forces were killed by the Taliban or disappeared since the group has seized power, according to the Human Rights Watch report. The Taliban seizure of power by force has been catastrophic for Afghans who every day are subjected to human rights abuse. And not only has been, uh, there ha been a collapse in the rule of law, Afghan journalists cannot investigate. Let's go back for a moment. In late 2001, when the U.S. drove the Taliban from power, there was no free and independent media in Afghanistan. Journalism did not exist. Two decades later, when the U.S. backed up government fell, the country boasted more than 130 TV channels, radio stations numbers to close, close to 300, and print and online publications totaled nearly 200. Today, the number have dwindled. 81 TV channels, 63 print um, and online publications, and the number of radio stations have almost halved. For Afghan reporters, editors, and broadcasters, there's been a wave of job loses. Their rank depleted more by more than half since last summer. For the nation, it has meant that there is hardly even any reliable news and information. After the Taliban took over last year, the group issued 11 vaguely worded roles for Afghan journalists. The first three forbid stories that ran contrary to Islam, insult national figures, or violate privacy. But there, ha but there was no specific guidance as to what would constitute a breach or who would determine whether coverage had violate, violated those rules. According to the recent reports, 979 women who were working as journalists a year ago more than 75% have lost their jobs since the Taliban took over. When I talk to female journalists in Afghanistan, they say they feel trapped and there is no way out. Those journalists still working speak of climate of fear, fear of writing or tweeting, or even saying a wrong thing as the Taliban imposed its threat across Afghan society. Journalists in several provinces say that they now had no choice but to censor what they write or broadcast. There are, all, there are also reports of violence. In mid-January, a journalist in Kabul said he was visited late at night by two men who said they were with the local police. According to an account published by the Committee to Protect Journalists, when he opened the door, one of the men trapped, grabbed him and hit him in in the head with an identified object and other whose face was covered tried to stab him in the neck with a knife. Freedom, the freedom of information law was a strong and held um, Afghan journalists for the number of years and it should be uh, respected. Freedom of press and freedom of ma free media and the country uh, and, secu and secu uh, security of Afghan journalists should be conditional um, for international engagement with the Taliban and it should and be exploited uh, in all international human rights mechanism. Violence and should, uh, violence should trigger a punitive measure in line with the uh, broader international pressure on the Taliban to respect human rights. With many Afghan journalists no longer able to safety and occur accurately report, international journalists and media outlet must help shed light on human rights abuses perpetrated by the Taliban. Support independent Afghan media with financial aid and professional training. There is no good Taliban or no or change Taliban. The Taliban's seizure of power has been catastrophic for all Afghans. For now, I urge you again to show solidarity and emphasize on your responsibilities in not legitimizing the Taliban. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatima, for your strong voice on this and for telling us what the fate of the free media has been since the Taliban have taken over and the price um, Afghanistan is paying for that. We're going to turn now to Najla Hayubi. She is a judge 
human, human rights activist, lawyer, championed women's empowerment, civic education, and transparency across Afghanistan. She recently served as the legal advisor for Afghanistan State Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs and has held roles as state attorney and judge with the Attorney General's Office in Parwan. She was also the commissioner at the Independent Elections Commission of Afghanistan and instrumental in Afghanistan's constitution making. Currently, she serves as chief of the coalition and global program for Every Woman Treaty. Judge Najla, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would echo what my colleagues, my fellow colleagues mentioned already, but um, I would like to start with the statement that the situation is really bad. The situation is really worrying. There is a total lack of legal system. As a lawyer, I see that there is a total lack of legal system in legal institutions. Substantively, no one knows what laws Taliban is following. We are not certain about which laws the Taliban will follow in the future. There are no mechanisms for ensuring the rule of law. Implementation, of course. If you don't have, if you don't have the institution, then there are no frameworks for, the, for implementation of the laws. What it, what it means that the streets and cities of Afghanistan become the courtrooms. Um, the judges and the juries. In lieu of the situation, we have street justice. Women, of course, have been tortured, as my colleague mentioned, forcibly disappeared, murdered, and hunted which has consequences of women working in the law and women seeking recourse through the law. Women judges have been harassed in two ways. First of all, the Taliban intimidate us. For example, in the past six months, they have several times and multiple times they came to my home, uh, ambushing my home. Second, Women judges have been hunted by those they sentenced to prison. The Taliban released all those who have committed brutal crimes against women, those convicted like murder, rape, forced marriage, abuse, and torture. Releasing these people from prison has created serious security risk for my fellow judges and also lawyers on the ground. Women judges are not the only people who are hiding right now. Other women working in the law have been also sent home. They have lost the income, they are unemployed, and also they lost their uh, livelihood. So women have been eliminated from the justice system, and this happens in the same time women and girls have been denied from education. Unless this changes, women and girls will not be able to go to university, to law school, and will therefore have no chance or path to the career in the law sector. Taliban, unfortunately, the Taliban have a godlike power in, the set, in all settings. They are, they are making all the decisions on everything in the country. That's the bottom line. We are urging the international community uh, to step in and support the women's rights activists and also the, uh, the lawyers in Afghanistan. First, the international community should be aware, first of all, I would like to really emphasize this part, that the international community should be aware that the Taliban is using women's rights as a bargaining chip in their attempt to get what they want from the international community. To hold them in account, I suggest two-pronged approach. One, of course, the, um, the uh, extension of the mandate of the UNAMA, and the second one is, um, I, will get, I will get to that. Particularly, if the international community could help to, for us to get the documenting, investigating, and fact-finding roles to the UNAMA 
for rule of law and women access to justice, that's one of the, one of the mandate of the UNAMO should be. Second, UNAMO prisons can serve to, to pressure the Taliban to reestablish the justice sector, particularly the, the judicial system. And also, UNAMO can also support violence prevention education, violence survivor service, and also a training for justice prof sector professionals. The second recommendation, which I, th that was uh, the first one, the second, which is the uh, short term, we need a treaty. Ultimately, we need a comprehensive international framework on violence against women and girls to safeguard women's rights in Afghanistan. In, on the past six months, on the six month of anniversary of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, more than 220 Afghan women advocates wrote to President Biden, asked him and urging him to call and to champion for the global treaty ending violence against women and girls. This included multiple members of um, Afghan parliamentarians. The treaty making process progress, when the treaty making process progresses, the Taliban will face increased international shaming, ostracization, if they resist recognizing the women's rights to be free from violence. This is especially so given the active leadership roles fellow Muslim majority countries are assuming on violence against women. And Qatar is one of the examples. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, and for giving us that focus also on what's happening with the judiciary, particularly women judges and justice today in Afghanistan, or the lack thereof, I should say. We're going to turn now to our final Afghan speaker, Yalda Royan. She is a leading activist who has spearheaded women's rights initiatives in Afghanistan as a gender advisor for the Ministry of Women's Affairs, their organizational restructuring and empowerment project, the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development, and Independent Directorate of Local Governance. She's also held roles with the World Bank, USIP, Oxfam, and Counterpart International, where she led gender initiatives. Currently, she works as a consultant to voice and continues to speak out to advance political, economic, and social participation uh, of women in Afghanistan with a focus on Afghans minorities who've also come under terrible threats. Welcome, uh, Yalda. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Madam Virveer and Georgetown Institute of Peace, Women, uh, Women, Peace and Security, Excellencies, Under Secretary Generals, and all dignitaries and representatives of the Security Council, member states, UN entities, and civil society that have gathered here today. The fall of Kabul was the end of democracy, human rights, prosperity, and humanity for all Afghans, and devastating for Afghan women and minorities. While I'm grateful that many of us were evacuated, I grieve for those who remain. Since August, women's rights have all but been eliminated, and targeted killings torture, forced expulsions, and other forms of violence against women and certain ethnic groups continue, though they are not reported, as the Taliban controls the, the national media and the international media has shifted its focus. Brave Afghan women leaders and activists and members of the Hazara community and other ethnic groups who remain in the country have been silenced. For now, they are focused on sharing information and analysis with Afghan women leaders and activists like us in the hope that these stories will regain the world's attention and compel its leaders to act. I'm honored and humbled to be here and share these untold stories with you. Reported cases of suicide amongst women have increased dramatically. While some women have undoubtedly committed suicide out of despair and hopelessness, the women's rights activists that I'm in touch with believe that many of these women are being murdered by their families. 
And while we have all heard the heartbreaking stories of young girls being sold into marriage, my contacts tell me that Hazara girls are also regularly being disappeared and murdered in Western Kabul. In the past week alone, I learned about 16-year-old Sharifa and 17-year-old Fatima who were killed in Balkh and was told that the dead body of an 11-year-old girl was found on a street in Dashtebarchi in Kabul. All of these girls were Hazaras. Even the 5,000 women who worked in the security sector, many of whom were Hazara, cannot protect themselves and are now in hiding as they fear for their lives. The murder of Negar, who was six months pregnant, and the disappearance of Aliya Azizi, both former police officers, was widely reported last year. Yet Aliya's family still does not know if she is dead or alive. Disappearances and executions of women will continue as long as no one is held accountable. The Taliban is not just eliminating women from the security sector. It has systematically worked to harass, intimidate, and resort to murder to drive women out of any profession where they hold authority outside of the home. In addition to the Hazaras, the Taliban is targeting other ethnic groups, particularly Sikhs, Uzbeks, and the Tajiks in Panjshir province. A video showing the murder of a young Tajik man in Panjshir went viral on social media five days ago. The Taliban are detaining Tajiks and Hazaras and those that are re released are hostages in their homes. 50 Hazara men were fired from Central Statistics Office in a single day. Although these men lost their livelihoods, the Taliban demands that they pay usher, traditionally an Islamic tithe, which families now must pay to the Taliban or face punishment. This is how the Taliban is raising the increased revenue that UNAMA commended them for in a recent briefing to the Security Council. The Taliban is also raising revenue by conducting terrifying raids on Tajik and Hazara homes in Kabul, claiming they are searching for illegal arms, and then requiring payoffs to not report families for contraband they have allegedly found. But the Taliban does not just seek to terrorize and control minorities through violence. It is banning the use of our language, Farsi or Dari, in government and universities to further eliminate our identity. The Taliban is also manipulating humanitarian aid. The Taliban and its supporters are prioritized in aid distribution. Women heads of households and widows are last on the list. Without Hazaras in distribution teams, Local media estimates that Hazara communities in Bamiyan and Daikundi provinces and west of Kabul receive just 2% of aid. Aid distribution to Hazaras has ceased completely in dasht -e barchi in western Kabul in the last two weeks. While these communities have raised the alarm on this countless times, the international community has failed to listen and rectify this. Over the past 20 years, UNAMA has played an important role in strengthening national institutions and state building. It monitored and reported on human rights and coordinated humanitarian assistance. In the absence of a legitimate government or protection and prevention mechanisms for marginalized groups, the role of UNAMA is now even more critical. And yet, women and minorities frankly feel abandoned by UNAMA. It is vital that Security Council members fully empower UNAMA to support the people of Afghanistan and apply the principles of the UN's right, Rights Upfront Initiative to UNAMA's work. Therefore, I call on UNAMA to first, maintain its neutrality with all parties, its actions if its actions or words are seen to be aligned with the Taliban, it will fail in its duty to the people of Afghanistan, especially women and minorities. Second, 
take an inclusive human rights approach to its work, investigate and report human rights abuses, including women's rights, violations by all actors. UNAMA's current approach is not working. It should coordinate its work with the new special reporter, and together they should work with women leaders, women's organizations, and members of the Hazara community and other marginalized groups as partners who can help inform, shape, and monitor the UN's policy, programs, and reports. And finally, implement a mechanism for overseeing and monitoring equitable humanitarian aid distribution. It is no less than horrifying that the most at-risk groups in Afghanistan are the most likely to face barriers in accessing aid. I thank you again for the opportunity to address you. I will be watching along with Afghans and others around the world as the Council meets on Thursday to consider UNAMA's mandate. Please take heed of our words here today and do not let the people of Afghanistan down. History has its eyes on you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yalda, and thank you for putting a spotlight on what is happening in the minority communities and even using aid distribution as a punitive measure against them. Um, we thank each and every one of you for your leadership and commitment but, and for illuminating today what has become invisible almost uh, on our new, in our newspapers, on our screens. Uh, we don't see what you've been talking about today. And it's so important that particularly here at the United Nations, we understand what is happening, happening on human rights, on the fate of the media, the fate of the judicial system, and, and to minority groups, and at this moment, um, so critical as th this body and the Security Council uh, takes on the UNAMA mandate and the elements that you all laid out as being important in con to consider. So thank you to each of you, um, and now we will have the member state interventions. We're going to turn now to um, the representative from France, Her Excellency Minister Marino. Thank you very much. Excellencies, dear friends, I would like to thank the, organiz the organizers for convening this very important meeting. I would also like to thank warmly all women from Afghan civil society who have shared their valuable experience. We have heard your message and we stand with you. France is deeply concerned by the constant report of human rights violation which affects women and girls in Afghanistan since the Taliban takeover. We strongly condemn any form of violation of these fundamental rights. We are also worried by the growing humanitarian crisis in the country. In this regard, our action in the past six months and for the future remains guided by one objective, helping the Afghan people, in particular women and girls. Our action therefore relies on three key priorities. First. We call for the respect of human rights and the inclusion of all women and girls in the public life of the country. Afghanistan is a part of the CEDO and all it oblig its obligations, international obligations, can't be a la carte. Women represent almost 49% of the Afghan society. A civil society cannot exist when half of the population is denied access to the very basic rights. Women and girls should have an equal access to schools, health services, and public infrastructures. Second, we call for the respect of international humanitarian law. This is a pillar on which no compromise can be made. It also means that female aid workers must be allowed to deliver aid in all provinces. We have provided and will continue to provide humanitarian aid to the population. 
France has already announced 100 million euro last September for the humanitarian response in Afghanistan. And third, we strongly reaffirm our commitment to holding the Taliban accountable. We therefore support a robust mandate for UNAMA when it comes to women, peace, and security. Finally, the establishment of a representative government is also part of our expectation. Excellencies, dear friends, Afghan men and women have fought for more than 20 years for access to education and freedom of expression. These gains must be preserved. Rest assured that we will remain strong advocates of women and girls' rights in Afghanistan to ensure that they are never, ever left behind. Because protecting Afghan women's rights is protecting all women's rights all over the world. Ukrainian, Yemenit, and the Sahel. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we're going to turn now to Canada um, and Her Excellency, the Ambassador for Women, Peace, and Security, who is coming to us virtually. Thank you, Madam Chair. Milan, greetings to our diplomatic colleagues and to civil society representatives present, and profound, profound thanks to Luria, Fatima, Najla, and Yalda. Many of us gathered in this same space about five months ago, and here we are again, hearing from more brave women and witnessing no change in the Taliban's posture and willingness to adapt, reform, and pro progress. And as time passes, we are seeing a new status quo emerging, one that affords the Taliban a level of comfort that is wholly undeserved. We cannot downplay the risks of normalizing support that is addressing the economic and humanitarian situation, but falls short of challenging human rights abuses and the governance failures that are characterized by a model of governance that is neither representative nor inclusive. An Afghan colleague described that women generally, and women activists in particular, are being perceived as co-conspirators. Uh, who had conspired with forces who tried to eliminate the Taliban over decades. And every day, in every aspect of their lives, they are punished for it. As each of our speakers just said, some are literally hunted. As the international community calibrates its assistance and policies, we need to hold the Taliban responsible for fulfilling its commitments. Receiving independent, verified human rights reporting with a focus on gender will be crucial in this regard. And so in line with the Secretary General's report, and as stated by Ms. Mossadegh, Canada supports the inclusion of a robust human rights service in the UNAMA mandate renewal, with the ability to advocate for and report on the human rights situation. We know that thousands of Afghan women are mobilizing both from within the country as well as from abroad. Afghan women and girls have called for their rights to fully participate in all aspects of civic, economic, and political life, and Canada fully endorses these very legitimate demands. And we are determined to continue to provide support for Afghan women, peace builders, human rights defenders, journalists, and more. We recognize and honor the women and men who have so courageously spoken out against the rollback of rights, including our speakers today. We know you face severe threats and we recognize your deep frustration regarding many of the international community's responses. So I'll end by assuring you again that Canada has not and will not forget Afghanistan. You and the communities you represent have been heard today. We will continue to maintain unity with our colleagues and partners, coordinate and above all, keep listening to Afghan women. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador O'Neill. We're going to turn now to the permanent representative of Ireland. So thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Milan, and I want to thank you for bringing us uh, together with UK and Qatar today, and particularly for the excellent work Georgetown does, not just today, but throughout the year in highlighting this issue. And I want to wish a very warm welcome uh, to Her uh, Royal Highness the Countess of Wessex, and also thank her for her advocacy and the work she does on this. Um, most importantly and above all, I want to say a thank you to Haraya, Fatima, Najala and Yalda. Your clear, 
impassioned, and really deeply moving presentations were quite extraordinary. We hear you. Uh, your words will mark us as we work here in the UN. They'll certainly inform Ireland's approach to the situation in Afghanistan at the security, at the UN and beyond. As you all know, this is a big week here in the UN. Uh, it's the CSW week uh, when diplomats and civil society like to come together uh, to discuss gender equality, women's empowerment, um, our capacity to participate. But frankly, uh, this meeting, for me, this is our reality check. Uh, it's the red flag meeting, as I see it. Um, you know, uh, it tells me that we cannot afford one second of complacency in all of the talk that we have at these tables and in these corridors. And all those commitments that I spoke of about women's participation, promoting equality, tackling sex and gen sexual and gender-based violence will come to naught, and I want to underline that, it will come to naught if we don't respond to what we heard from you today and act on it, frankly. So I want to really say thank you um, to you. Um, you know, those, those commitments that we're speaking about here in the corridors of the UN, realizing them, there is nowhere more pressing than Afghanistan. But sadly, I think we recognize there's actually probably nowhere more challenging than Afghanistan to deliver on them. Uh, we're a proudly elected member of the Security Council. Um, and despite, and I wanted to pick up on the point made by the US Special Envoy here, despite the competing challenges we have with the, uh, the horrors we're seeing in, in Ukraine following the Russian invasion there, we are capable of doing more than one thing and doing more than one right thing at the same time. And we're just two days out now from the expiry, we've heard that, of the UNAMA mandate. It's clear um, for us from the, not least the powerful messages we heard from my sisters to, to the left here today, that we're at an urgent inflection point here in Afghanistan. And I want to say to you, quite frankly, as a member of the Security Council, I'm concerned that the Security Council could fall short of our responsibilities um, as we face into this debate this week. There are risks. Um, the past six months, as we've heard, have been devastating. They've seen a new reality for women and girls in Afghanistan. Oppression, we heard about. Restrictions, we heard about. Erasure, we heard about. And we simply cannot look the other way. The denial of the right to work, right to move freely in society, compounded by arrest, detention, house searches, simply unacceptable. Um, for Ireland, it's right, it's necessary, but it's also our political as well as our moral responsibility that we make sure that the UNAMA mandate meets the needs of the women and girls of Afghanistan. Um, we also want to see it integrate gender considerations and advocacy across the entire mandate, from human rights to humanitarian action, and very importantly, on this inclusive aspect of governance that several of you touched on today. I'm under no illusions about the gravity, the seriousness, or the scale of the challenge, but I do want to say Ireland is making this a priority in the negotiations. Um, I want to uh, say that the, the shaping of the mandate, as we see it, has to have a strong human rights base. I heard that uh, said at the very beginning of the interventions today. And the degradation of Afghanistan's natural, national human rights infrastructure just makes women more, ba more uh, vulnerable by definition. Uh, we want to see that addressed. We want to see a strong uh, child protection focus in the mandate. And I believe, as we've heard from others, that a window is closing on the right to girls' education. That's something we will watch so carefully. We say it once, we say it a thousand times. We will judge the Taliban by their actions, not by their words. So in closing, I want to assure you, um, if I haven't conveyed it properly, that we are working very hard uh, in partnership with our council uh, colleagues to make sure that the mandate for the UN in Afghanistan is the one that the women of Afghanistan deserve and that it upholds the rights of women in Afghanistan. We're not asking for anything more, but we're certainly not asking for anything less. For, for us, we don't think there's another option. So thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Bernaysen. Uh, we now turn to the permanent representative of Indonesia.
Thank you, Chair. Let me uh, firstly welcome the presence of uh, Her Royal Highness. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me uh, firstly welcome the presence of Her Royal Highness, the Countess of Wessex, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by sincerely thanking uh, all our briefers uh, today. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights on the situation of uh, women uh, in uh, women's rights in Afghanistan. Uh, this will be very important, uh, especially uh, as we are approaching the renewal of our unanimous mandate. Uh, I will be brief uh, so we can hear uh, the other participants, so allow me to share uh, three points. Uh, first, a uh, unanimous mandate uh, should ensure and facilitate uh, the delivery of humanitarian assistance uh, by, by the international community. Uh, an unhindered access for humanitarian assistance must remain the highest priority of UNAMA in, in Afghanistan. The, desire, uh, the dire humanitarian situation in, in Afghanistan requires UNAMA to work closely uh, with all uh, stakeholders. It is therefore important uh, for UNAMA to facilitate uh, the delivery of humanitarian assistance by the international community, including by providing uh, clear uh, guidelines. Uh, second, uh, we need uh, to continuously work to ensure the full respect of uh, women's rights and participation in, in Afghanistan. We need to amplify our advocacy uh, towards a constructive approach uh, to uphold women's rights and participation. Uh, as one of the largest democracy and home to the largest uh, Muslim population uh, in the world, uh, for Indonesia, women's rights uh, and participation is a universal uh, ideal. Well, we are committed to use uh, our expertise uh, to working together with all stakeholders to advance uh, women's rights. Uh, third, uh, we need to empower uh, Afghan women to bring changes. Indonesia firmly believes uh, on the role of Afghan women uh, in mo uh, in the most critical, as the most critical in our collective efforts to uphold women's rights uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, a lasting change uh, could only come uh, from the Afghans uh, themselves, not implemented uh, from the outside. And this has been Indonesia's approach uh, to strengthen women's representation and empowerment uh, in Afghanistan through the Afghanistan's Indonesia uh, Women's Solidarity Network and Capacity Building Program. Indonesia is wor working to empower uh, uh, Afghan women. Uh, this solidarity network focuses on empower empowering uh, Afghan women as a peace agent uh, at all levels, uh, especially at the grassroots uh, level. Uh, we look forward uh, to working continuously in advancing uh, the women's rights and participation uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We turn now to the Deputy Minister of Norway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues and distinguished speakers, I would like to thank the organizers for convening this timely and important conversation on upholding women's rights in Afghanistan. And we are particularly thankful to Her Royal Highness, the Countess of Wessex, for your continued advocacy. We are indebted to the courage of Afghan women leaders, including the Afghan briefers who've joined us today, who remind the international community that our shared goals on gender equality must not be hollow words but translate into tangible actions and partnership to support the women and girls of Afghanistan. And I would like to thank the distinguished Afghan women briefers for sharing your experience, your advice, and your recommendations today. Colleagues and distinguished, distinguished speakers, I would like to bring three issues to our conversation today. The first is human rights. As we've been reminded by uh, by Horia, by Fatima, by Najla, and by Yalda today. Upholding the rights of women and girls is fundamental to the future of, of Afghanistan. This includes your right to education and work, the right to expression, assembly, and association, and other rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, to which Afghanistan is a state party. Indeed, these rights, are the very building blocks of sustainable development, community resilience, and ultimately, peace. Towards this end, let me reiterate that Norway has committed to putting the rights of women and girls on the agenda of every conversation we have with the Taliban. We have made very clear that the rights of women and girls, 
Their knowledge and leadership are central to prosperity and peace in Afghanistan. Second is accountability. The international community must hold the Taliban accountable for their stated promises on women's and girls' rights. When Norway arranged a three-day meeting with the Taliban in our capital of Oslo in January, we facilitated an opportunity for women and men from Afghan civil society to engage directly with the Taliban in a dialogue on the way forward for Afghanistan. While we've seen little progress since then, this, we believe, was a first step towards accountability. Dialogue between the Taliban and Afghan civil society needs to continue to help address political needs, human rights needs, and humanitarian needs of the Afghan people. In this regard, the international community must be a steadfast partner of Afghan civil society, especially women from diverse backgrounds, by amplifying your voices and underlining your participation in all decision-making about the future of Afghanistan. And my third and final point, Norway as penholder of the UNAMA mandate renewal believe in a broad and robust UN mandate in Afghanistan is more important than ever. The UN needs to have a mandate to promote political dialogue, to monitor and report on the human rights situation, to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance and support to basic human needs. We have strived to maintain and reinforce the strong mandate of UNAMA to promote gender equality and women's participation, as well as the rights of women and girls. These elements are indeed more important than ever. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. We are going to turn now to Liechtenstein and to um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for putting the spotlight on the situation of women in Afghanistan during the CSW session. And thank you to our speakers from Afghanistan for your deeply going words about the situation in your country. The women and girls of Afghanistan deserve our continuous and steadfast support given the very precarious situation they find themselves in. There is a special obligation for all of us and for the United Nations to ensure their full enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. Afghanistan must have a peaceful and prosperous future, and women can and must play a decisive role in shaping it as mediators, lawyers, civil society leaders, human rights defenders, and in political positions. Sadly today, we are very far away from this goal. Instead, women are denied equal access to education, employment, and freedom of movement. We have to impress on those exercising effective control in Afghanistan, their obligations under international human rights law as one indispensable prerequisite for the recognition they are looking for. We also must insist on an inclusive, negotiated political settlement with the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women, in line with the Security Council Resolution 2593. Afghan women and children have always been disproportionately impacted by the conflict that has pledged the country for such a long time. Their misery is being compounded by a collapsing economy and deteriorating humanitarian situation. We will continue providing humanitarian assistance to elevate the suffering on the civilian population. There is a special role for the United Nations in addressing the challenges ahead. It is therefore essential that UNAMA's mandate is renewed in a robust manner that allows it to play a key role in responding to the needs of the Afghan people and in laying the foundations for sustainable peace and development in accordance with the past decisions of the Security Council. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Hassler. Uh, we're going to turn now to Italy uh, and to um, uh, Minister Bonetti. Mr. 
Honours, Excellencies, first of all, let me thank Oria, Fatima, Naila, Yalda for your briefing and your courage. And let me express Italy's solidarity for you and for all women and girls in Afghanistan. The upcoming mandate renewal of UNAMA is the defining moment to reiterate the strong support of the international community for women and girls in Afghanistan and to reaffirm our lasting commitment to preserve their rights and their fundamental freedoms. Such commitment guided the Italian action since the very beginning, in the days that immediately followed the Taliban takeover. On 26 August last year, Italy organized the first G20 conference on women's empowerment in Santa Margherita Ligure. On that occasion, I strongly supported the idea of organizing a ministerial meeting on the condition of women in Afghanistan, which was then held in the margins of the UNGA high-level ministerial week. The current situation in Afghanistan is deeply concerning for women and girls as the enjoyment of their rights rapidly deteriorated since the Taliban seized power in sharp contrast with the results that had been achieved over the past 20 years. In light of the current deteriorated context, it is essential that the Security Council provide the UN political mission with a robust mandate to monitor and report on the human rights situation, especially when it comes to women and girls' rights. Besides monitoring and reporting human rights violations, the UNAMA must also be empowered with ensuring the prevention and elimination of gender-based violence. It should also be entrusted with advising on the implementation of the main conventions to which Afghanistan is a state party and thus to which Afghanistan is bound, in particular the CEDU. Italy is in favor of retaining a strong human rights presence within UNAMA and supports the recommendations contained in the latest report of the Secretary General when it comes to the Human Rights Service. A robust human rights mandate for UNAMA, along with the welcome appointment last October of a special rapporteur on Afghanistan, will ensure an impartial UN oversight of the human rights situation on the ground, while at the same time marking a critical step towards accountability. Italy stands by the courage of women and girls of Afghanistan, who deserve to live, to live in safety, security and dignity, to be empowered and to be active actors of change and reiterates that any form of violence against them should never be tolerated. We cannot fail them, so we call upon all the members of the Security Council not to fail them either. Now, more than ever, it is necessary to ensure that the rights of women and girls are guaranteed to prosecute the offenders responsible for the violation of their rights and to prevent any action threatening women and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Uh, we will turn now to Turkey and uh, to Minister Yannick. Pardon me. Microphone's not on. Can you please turn your microphone on? It's not working. Can, maybe you can take another mic. Okay. 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 Now. Okay. Honourable Chair, dear participants, uh, first of all, we thank United Kingdom, Qatar, UN Women, and the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security for organizing this important meeting. I would like to express our full solidarity with all women and girls living in conflict situations and other emergencies. We must ensure that all women and girls in all conflicts and crises are involved in the resolution efforts to have their basic needs met and be able to resort to justice if their rights are, uh, are violated uh, and continue to access essential services. 
delivering life-saving and empowering outcomes for peace and security is a collective endeavor. It calls for the combined efforts of the governments, international and regional organizations. Likewise, the effective implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda requires focus on all its four pillars, participation, conflict preve prevention, protection and relief, and recovery, with a holistic and balanced approach. However, 22 years after the adoption of the landmark resolution 1325, we see that the agenda's effective implementation continues to face challenges. The UN overtook the responsibility to enhance the lives of the Af Afghan people and bring peace and stability to the country. However, the living conditions have seemingly worsened for the Afghan people. The women and girls in Afghanistan have been impacted tremendously due to economic and financial inst instability and lack of sa safety and security. Many young girls have been forcefully married at a very young age to escape poverty and starvation. The search for a better life elsewhere from Afghanistan has led many to become migrants who have already left the country. There are others who have risked their lives to live in dangerous conditions of escape which have uh, even resulted in death. Many still have the idea to escape the difficult living conditions because they are hopeless. The poverty levels have increased tremendously. The Afghan people have faced many challenges, including lack of peace and lack of stability, which has made the Afghan women and girls to suffer the most. In order to bridge the gap between commitments and action, we not only need to do more, but also do things differently. Uh, this involves focusing on root causes of inequality, inequalities and frailty, considering links between those challenges and implementation. We should also recognize women as agents of change rather than as passive beneficiaries of aid. Turkey supports the empowerment and well-being of women and girls in various emergency, conflict or post-conflict situations around the world without any discrimination such as ethnicity or religion through its comprehensive development system programs. The project we carry out in Afghanistan, especially in the fields of education and health services, are concrete examples of our efforts towards this goal. In Afghanistan, Tur Turkey currently operates 45 schools across the, across the country, 14 of which are your schools. We have also been stressing the importance of political inclu inclusivity and the protection and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms to the caretaker government. We invite the current government to be inclusive and to respect the fundamental rights of all to guarantee women and girls access to education and employment. This is non-negotiable. We believe that any positive statements made or any positive steps taken towards this goal, of, uh, this goal is of great importance. As Turkey, we have always been ready to, de to dedicate our experiences, practices and projects in promoting women's rights to the benefit of Afghan women and all women in other parts of the world. Last year, we had planned to hold an additional peace process conference in Turkey with the participation of women from Afghanistan civil society. Unfortunately, we couldn't achieve this uh, due to the political developments in the region. Afghan women and girls deserve to live in safety, security and dignity. We remain steadfast in amplifying their voices to ensure that their concerns are heard. We call upon all member states to actively contribute to establishing peace, stability and human rights in the region and to reinforce Afghanistan's commitment to protect the rights of Afghan women and girls. We must also help improve living conditions for all the Afghan people in every possible way so that they so that they may have the chance to live their lives in dignity, just like every human being deserves to do so. We, mu we must also instill hope for the Afghan people to help build a better future for themselves and their country, Afghanistan. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Minister. We turn now to Greece and to the Deputy Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. It is a great honor to be here with uh, women who have connected their lives and actions with the acquisition of fundamental human rights in uh, your country, as well as women's rights for freedom, self-determination, access to education, health and security. The Greek government stood by the women of Afghanistan. Our Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, along with the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Migration, worked together and managed to help uh, Afghan women. More than one-third of the female representation into the Afghan parliament were evacuated to Greece, together with a, a substantial number of other women leaders, including judges, journalists, women's rights activists, athletes, and others. They mobilized in support of their country immediately after their arrival and have just formed an organization titled Afghan Women Parliamentarians and Leaders Network, which is already participating in high-level dialogue within the EU and the European External Action Service and aims to have international presence in support of Afghan issues and women's rights. Currently, we are organizing a forum to take place in Greece. In cases of humanitarian crisis, such as uh, in Afghanistan or Ukraine, we must show our solidarity, especially in the vulnerable groups, women, girls, and children who are at high risk right now. Thus, your presence is crucial to remind everyone how worth it is the fight for women's rights and how important it is for humanity to include all its members, men and women. It is time to work collectively with our European and international allies, not only to reaffirm the political engagement, but also take concrete action to uphold the rights of women and girls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we turn now to Ukraine, to the Commissioner. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am a Government Commissioner for Gender Equality Policy from Ukraine. And uh, I would like to express strong solidarity of Ukrainian women with uh, Afghan women. We understand very well all pain and injustice of war and military aggression. And uh, the current situation in Afghanistan is a clear example of how women's human rights are violated. Ukrainian women are standing with Afghan women. In August 2021, Ukraine evacuated 500 Afghan refugees, and the majority of them were women and children. And now Ukraine itself became the biggest country of refugees in the world. Unfortunately, exact now, Russian military troops continue to bomb and shell peaceful Ukrainian towns and villages civilian infrastructure, schools, kindergartens, hospitals, churches, power plants, including nuclear. Russia brutally repeats the war scenario in Ukraine from the war in Chechnya, in Georgia, Syria, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and other countries of the world. And as responsible international community, we have to do everything to stop this military madness. For 20 days of full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russian armed forces already have killed more than 3,000 civilians. Majority of those are women and 100 children. Uh, Russia creates that threat not only for us, but for the whole world. Three million of Ukrainian refugees have been forced to flee as the brutal Russian invasion on their homeland. They are in vulnerable situation at the moment. And I call all of you to do um, everything, everything to ensure uh, their human rights, defend them from violence, from trafficking in human beings, from injustice. Currently, Ukraine with partners are preparing the statement on the situation of women and girls as a result of Russian aggression against Ukraine. 
and I kindly call you to join to this statement for being the strong voice of all women and girls suffering from military conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now turn to the permanent representative of Japan. Madam President, well, uh, before uh, starting my remarks, I would like to express uh, our full solidarity to the people and the government of Ukraine. I would like to express my appreciation to the co-host for convening this important event as this, uh, at this critical uh, timing leading up to the mandate renewal of UNAMA. I also uh, thank other speakers and uh, briefers for the comprehensive updates. The international community is uh, gravely concerned about the current human security crisis in Afghanistan, which threatens the survival, livelihood, and dignity of people in most vulnerable situations, including women and girls. They are denied of access to employment, education, and freedom of movement. For the people and government of Japan, having supported women in Afghanistan by prioritizing their protection, empowerment, and full and meaningful participation to the peace process, the current situation where their human rights are violated is excruciating. UNAMA's work, together with other UN institutions, is indispensable to ensure the human security of the Afghan women and girls and a comprehensive and gender responsive renewal of its mandate is essential. Japan supports strengthening of UNAMA's mandates and will monitor closely the actions the Taliban will take in relation to human rights and participate actively in international efforts, including those led by UNAMA and by the UN system as a whole. I thank you. Thank you, and we now turn to the permanent representative of Malta. Thank you. At the outset, allow me to express our solidarity with the people of Ukraine, the women and girls there, um, which we are thinking of constantly. Thank you for the, to the group of friends of women in Afghanistan, UN Women, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, and the co-sponsors for organizing this high-level event. I also thank the other speakers for their insightful opening remarks, as well as the Afghan Women panel briefers. Malta remains concerned that the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, continues to receive credible allegations of killings, enforced disappearings, and other violations in Afghanistan. Human rights defenders and media workers also continue to come under attack, intimidation, harassment, arbitrary arrest, ill-treatment, and killing. We are further concerned about the escalation of extrajudicial killings, the disappearance of former government employees, and the detention of women's rights activists and journalists, including ethnic and religious minorities. Humanitarian operations should be scaled up to meet immediate basic needs, including that of food security. In the absence of nearly all international presence on the ground, UNAMA's renewal in the Security Council is crucial. Malta believes that the mission should have a strong humanitarian rights mandate and be comprehensive, gender responsive and fully resourced to ensure that it can monitor, investigate and report on human rights abuses. It is equally important to advocate with all relevant duty bearers and to provide technical assistance to uphold the respect and protection of human rights without discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to the permanent representative of Sri Lanka. Uh, may I first of all thank the Royal Highness, the Countess of Wessex, for her leadership in upholding the rights of African women and human rights. Madam Chair, permit me the indulgence of presenting a few thoughts for consideration in an effort to address the horror stories we have heard this afternoon. No country has recognized the Taliban as Afghanistan's new administration since it took power in August of 2021. 
there has been much speculation about the preconditions and consequences of recognition. One important question is whether and how recognition or non-recognition may affect counter-terrorism efforts. The conventional approach is that foreign recognition is not legally constitutive or determinative of whether an entity, the present administration, is the govern government of a state. Rather, an entity qualifies as the government if it effectively, independently, and durably controls the state's territory. Its authority is recognized by the population, and there is no rival effective authority. Recognition may then simply be declaratory of this legal situation. But even in the absence of recognition, the entity will still be the legal government, if not at the least, the de facto government. It is against this background that I wish to place before this assembly these few thoughts. Women's rights are challenged under the current political situation in Afghanistan. It is a fact that is not disputed. What we are gathered here today, Madam Chairman, is to, yes, reinforce the importance of women's basic human rights and their inherent right to participate in political life in Afghanistan. But more so, we are gathered here today to ensure that UNAMA, UNAMA's mandate, which is up for renewal this month, is informed by the actual on the ground needs of women and results in outcomes that are tangible and reflect the priorities of those who are truly suffering on Afghan soil. The current UNAMA mandate, as I see it, is sixfold. Be that as it may, the mechanism, however, by which any one of these requirements can come to fruition is if the international community and mandated UN assistance missions work with the current dispensation in Afghanistan. The UNAMA mandate, which is up for renewal this month, needs to be more focused, more in tune with the actual reality on the ground, and reflect an acceptance and desire to work with the Taliban. This must not be misunderstood or understood to mean that there was an official recognition of the Taliban as being the legitimate government of Afghanistan, but in the nature of a humanitarian operation. In her briefing to the Security Council in March of this month, the United Nations Secretary General and the head of UNAMA mission, uh, Mrs. Deborah Lyons, highlighted this necessity of working with the de facto authorities. If the international community can positively highlight the progress made by the Taliban, it could request the Taliban's recognition uh, and uphold the upholding of basic human rights. Ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, does keeping the Taliban out of the negotiating table, out of these hallowed halls, create a detriment in securing the basic rights of those suffering women in Afghanistan? Would not bringing them into the fold create an opportunity to leverage political relationships for basic securement of rights? It may be a hard reality to comprehend, but the current international approach of targeted sanctions and other economic restrictions can hurt those we intend to save the most. The stifling of the Afghan economy means that we may have been implicit in the population's suffering Women and children's rights are the most vulnerable. I would venture to say that economic advancement and political participation was not, the, not perhaps the highest priority, but is achieving women's safety is mandatory. Madam Chair, there is no correct answer on how to respond to these violations of human rights. However, we must be careful not to continue to implement strategies or mandates that hurt those living in on Afghan territory. Providing development aid has been, the instrument, has been instrumental in being a lifeline to the Afghans. The UN and partners launched a more than 5 billion funding appeal for Afghans in January, on the, in January of 22. A flourishing and recovering society, Madam Chair, is not built on aid. It is built on political engagement, securement of basic rights, sustainable economy, and multilateralism. This will only occur 
if you can bridge the gulf of mistrust between the de facto government and the international community. If we have a quid pro quo relationship with the Taliban government, then we can demand change for the women of Afghanistan. It is a long game we must play uh, and one that requires us to step off our moral high ground and truly engage with ground realities. It is only then, Madam Chair, that we can dream of some relief to those vulnerable women and children on the ground in Afghanistan. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We now turn to the permanent representative of Sweden. Madam uh, Chair, thank you uh, so much. And can I also uh, uh, express my appreciation uh, to UK and, and to the state of Qatar for their leadership uh, when it comes to uh, uh, keeping us uh, uh, discussing and, and uh, uh, organizing us when it comes to the uh, support to the Afghan women. And more, most of all, I'd like to thank our sisters from, uh, from, from Afghanistan for the very strong and important uh, messages uh, to us. Madam, uh, Madam Chair, gender equality and women's rights and girls' uh, human rights are at the heart of Sweden's engagement in Afghanistan. Our support continues through the UN and partners like the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan, with the presence in, in the country uh, since, uh, since almost 40 years, which employs more than 6,000 uh, Afghan employees. Today, I would like to stress one key message. The work to support women and girls in Afghanistan cannot be done without them. While this is a simple principle, we unfortunately continue to have to repeat it. This is why we appreciate today's meeting's emphasis on the voices and perspective of women's leaders on the ground. These perspectives must, must serve as a lodestar for our policy and action. I would like to echo some of the key recommendations that have been mentioned today and that Afghan uh, women civil society leaders have emphasized in our consultations with them in recent weeks. First, the multidimensional crisis in Afghanistan requires a multidimensional response. We need a strong and integrated political human rights, humanitarian and peace building focus throughout our response. And this multidimensional and nexus focus must be a robust part of the UNAMA mandate. Second, we have to focus on women's participation and protection simultaneously. The political, human rights, humanitarian and peace-building responses cannot be sustainable, let alone legitimate, unless women participate in and help shape these processes. Moreover, unless we ensure rigorous and systematic protection mechanisms and human rights monitoring and reporting, it is not possible to ensure women's full, equal and meaningful participation. And finally, to make UNAMA more gender responsive, we as member states must walk the talk by providing full political and financial support. This includes a gender and human rights based perspective to our analysis, decisions and financing, not least in the fifth committee at the UN. Moreover, we must ensure space and flexible funding to civil society actors, especially women human rights defenders and peace builders. Before the takeover, Afghanistan was the largest recipient of Swedish development assistance. Today, we have redirected this support to local civil society actors, as well as the US, UN partners. And we continue to be one of the largest contributors of humanitarian uh, support. Sweden's long-standing and deep engagement in Afghanistan remain steadfast, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we turn now to the Deputy Permanent Representative from Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, Mexico thanks the organization of today's event. We recognize the presence of the Countess of Wessex and her work in favor of the human rights. We also extend our solidarity to all Ukrainians, especially women and girls. Madam Chair, Mexico deplores the circumstances described in Afghanistan by the speakers and we have heard the dramatic stories taking place. The erosion of human rights, especially the rights of women in a country that for 20 years fought for the promotion and protection. This is something that we, as the international community, simply cannot accept. The context is atrocious 
millions are at risk of famine. The health system is on the verge of collapse, and the country faces what would very well be universal poverty by the middle of the year. This situation, as we already know, disproportionately affects women and girls. The scarcity and lack of opportunities have clear implications in terms of access to education, work, and procuring basic means of subsistence. Women and girls face restrictions on their freedom of movement and endless limitations when it comes to participating in all aspects of public life. Mexico's position has been consistent in all forums. Women's rights are not negotiable. Women's rights are human rights. As co-chairs of the Women's Peace and Security Informal Working Group at the Security Council, Mexico will continue to advocate for the promotion and protection of the rights of all women and girls in Afghanistan. This is particularly true, relevant in the context of the UNAMA renewal. We will keep on pushing so that UNAMA mandate meets the needs that are necessary and we will strive for it to have a strong human rights base. Mexico has heard your voice. Here, in my capital, and everywhere where we are present, we will continue to do so, learning about your real needs and acting accordingly. This is the least you, the women of Afghanistan, deserve. We will not let the efforts of Afghan women be disregarded. Without them, there will be no sustainable peace nor development in Afghanistan. The future belongs to you, and your country must be shaped with the meaningful participation of all women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we turn to the special representative from Australia. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, on behalf of Australia, let me express solidarity with the people of Ukraine, including women and girls, as they face a terrible situation. And I'd like to thank you, Chair, and others for organizing today's session, but in particular join others in thanking the panel for their vivid, clear, and direct briefings. We can be left in no doubt about the importance of today's discussion and the importance that we sustain, we sustain our attention and focus on it going forward. It's also very timely that we discuss this as the UNAMA mandate is being considered. Human rights and the rights of women and girls must be an integral part of UNAMA's mandate. Australia expresses deep concern about human rights violations in Afghanistan, including harassment and temporary enforced disappearances of human rights defenders. All the reports of, investigation, all the reports of discrimination and abuse should be investigated. Afghan women and girls deserve to live in safety and with dignity. Australia agrees that women and girls' participation in political and economic life is essential to achieving sustained peace in Afghanistan. The Taliban have imposed harsh restrictions on women and girls' rights to education, work, and freedom of movement. Recent announcements that universities are open to women and schools will reopen to girls from 21st March are a first step, but more substantive action is needed. Australia calls on the Taliban regime to recognise the integral role women and girls play in public life and guarantee their full, equal and meaningful participation. We, the international community, will judge the Taliban by its implementation of its commitments. Australia strongly supports a mandate for the UN Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan and calls on the Taliban to afford free and unhindered access to the Rapporteur once appointed. If the Taliban is genuine in its commitment to human rights principles, including in relation to the role of women and girls in society as it claims, then it should welcome the transparency that the Rapporteur will bring. In conclusion, Australia acknowledges the important contribution of women and girls within Afghan society as agents of change. Afghan society has no stable future without the participation of women. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. I want to turn now to my Afghan colleague. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Vervi. I would like to uh, thank uh, you, um, a group of Friends of Women, and the uh, Georgetown Institute, and all uh, co-sponsors of this high-level uh, panel uh, and event. Uh, this is a really important at this crucial time for Afghanistan. And um, uh, usually in the past, uh, we used to have uh, uh, delegations for CSW from capital. Uh, women speakers and women delegation from Afghanistan. But I am very glad today that we have a great 
Afghan uh, women speakers, panelists, very brave, who very eloquently expressed uh, the voices of Afghan women in this uh, chamber and shared their demands and their uh, uh, expectations from all of you. And uh, I would like to also uh, um, echo and, uh, and uh, uh, express my full support to their uh, recommendations to be considered, uh, hopefully, in the discussions uh, for the UNAMO mandate. And uh, I would like to also express my appreciation to all speakers in this um, uh, high-level meeting who supported Afghan women in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. And um, this is, um, uh, we, we really appreciate that because we don't want that Afghanistan or Afghan women are uh, uh, um, abandoned. We want you, we want your support to continue and we hope that not only through the UNAMO mandate, but also through your engagements with the Taliban, you continue uh, supporting the fundamental human rights and expressions, freedom of expression of all Afghans, including women, and their full and equal participation in the public life. Uh, and, um, and this is critical and this is crucial. And also we would like to, um, we would like to request you that continue uh, in your engagements with the Taliban on, on uh, preserving the achievements that uh, Afghanistan and international community uh, uh, made for the last 20 years. And um, just once again, I would like to thank you and um, express our appreciation to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we hear from our final speaker, uh, the uh, Executive Director of UN Women, I'd like to ask our Afghan panelists uh, whether they have any last words for us, having listened to the interventions uh, oh, since you've last spoken to us. Any, please, Horia. First of all, I would like to thank everyone present in this room who have expressed their support and uh, solidarity with Afghan people, particularly Afghan women. And at the same time, I would like to thank many countries who stepped up and provided visas and uh, support and also protection for Afghan human rights defenders at risk. And I would like to name few countries here, which includes the government of Canada, Germany, Ireland, Norway, France, United States, Italy, Turkey, Greece, and many other countries who stepped in and they accommodated Afghan human rights defenders, journalists, and many other Afghans at risk. At the same time, I would like to say that the international community must stand firm and coordinated in their approach with the Taliban. When we are talking about conditionality, we really would like to see that there is coordination and also consolidated action by all actors across the board. When we speak about condition, conditionality on human rights, on women rights, on inclusivity of Afghanistan, we need to be co uh, coordinated and we need to be consolidated on that. Because receiving mixed messages from different actors with put Taliban at, on different level of uh, reaction towards us. At the same time, I would like to say that the Afghanistan Re Special Rapporteur position that was assigned by the United Nations is welcomed by many Afghans. We need that Special Rapporteur to have enough and adequate financial and political support in order to continue his job in Afghanistan. And at the same time, last but not least, I was, I was absolutely shocked by the remarks from uh, Ambassador of Sri Lanka. I don't think that the human rights and women's rights are something to be put on bidding in return for recognition or re recognition versus women's rights and human rights. I would like us to co uh, focus on universality of human rights. I would like to say if the government of Sri Lanka is brave enough to allow such a group to rule on their government or on their country, if the government of Sri Lanka would like a uh, group to come and put half of the population and imprison them into their own homes, I'm not 
I'm not disregarding, and I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any political debate or engagement with the Taliban. But those engagements need to be conditional, and those conditions need to be clear with clear benchmarks. You cannot just give blank checks to the Taliban and allow them to continue with the human rights violations and uh, torture, disappearances, and extrajudicial killings of Afghans who have nothing to do but to protest, but to uh, peacefully expressing their concern and ask for their rights. Thank you. Yalda. Madam, I got very emotional when I saw uh, Afghanistan representative speaking and it, I couldn't stop my tears. Um, let me first uh, share my sympathy with uh, the woman in Ukraine. Um, the woman in Ukraine didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve it, what we are going through right now. Um, the other thing I want to say is that uh, I almost heard from all of the member states here that they stand with us, they hear to us, and they will continue listening to us. But we do really need actions from these countries. If all of the countries who almost all of them have been in Afghanistan present in the past 20 years, if by their interventions, by their standing with us and by listening to us, everything is deteriorating day by day in Afghanistan, nothing is working, what is missing here? Have somebody thought of it? Why is it not working that you are all standing with us and we are just losing our rights if, with the passage of every day? I hope that, as Urhuria John said, what is happening in Afghanistan does not happen in any other country. And if you are standing with us, I would again say that please take actions for it. Um, I also heard from three of the countries at least, especially with Australia and Canada, that the news coming about the women's going back to the universities and the schools is a positive sign. Uh, let's not, not forget that Taliban is playing a very, very dirty game with the world. I'm so sorry, my apologies for the language that I'm using here, but they are lying to the world. Announcing that girls are going back to their schools or the, to the universities is not everything. They have revised the curriculum, they have removed all the, um, uh, the modern studies from the curriculum, and they have added the, the uh, subjects that are not matching the demands of the today's world. They are restricting women's um, access to resources in the universities, and that is not access to education, uh, according to my uh, perception. So I would again like to say that uh, when you are talking about achievements, please look at the details as well. As well. If you are talking about changes in the Taliban, we need to look at the details and see how the girls are going back to, to colleges or to universities. Thank you so much. Thank you all again, uh, Horia, Fatima, Najla, and Yalda. I know it's not easy to come here and to be able to speak as you have spoken to us, to giving us uh, the devastating portrait of the reality on the ground that we often do not hear. And I also know it's emotional. Uh, for you to relive a lot of this. So please know we're all very grateful to you. We're now going to turn to uh, Sima Bakhus, uh, the Executive Director of UN Women, for closing remarks. Thank you, Milani. Uh, ministers, Excellencies, all protocols observed. I thank the permanent missions of the United Kingdom and Qatar and the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for co-hosting this event together with UN Women, as well as our co-sponsors, Canada, Ireland, and the group of friends of women in Afghanistan, DPPA, and the Special Envoy. It is my honor to share this space with Afghan women leaders. Thank you for being here. The unwavering Afghan women's movement continues to drive and guide our work and inspire us all to greater action. On this day, it has been seven months since the Taliban took over Kabul. Since then, 
As we have heard today, there has been an alarming escalation in the reversal of the rights of Afghan women and girls. Afghan women's voices have been systematically silenced. They have been whipped, beaten, abducted, and detained simply for exercising their fundamental rights and freedoms. They have gone from being trapped in men's wars to being trapped in their homes. And even at home, they are not safe. In a time where Afghanistan is no longer making media headlines, I urge the international community to keep on the political pressure and to continue to advocate for the full spectrum of the rights of Afghan women and girls. This is the more important in the dire context of economic collapse and the growing food crisis, among other crises, as we have heard through this session. All rights are equal and interconnected. Afghan women are clear that it is not enough that Afghan girls can go to school, and we have just heard that again now. They must be able to go to university and have a chance to be economically independent. They must have a chance to a proper education. It is not acceptable that Afghan women can only work in a few sectors that the Taliban deem appropriate for women. Women have the right to work in the profession they choose and to fully participate in all spheres of public life. Since the Taliban took over the country, women have been protesting for their rights. But after a violent crackdown by the Taliban and the abduction of several women protesters, many women moved their activism behind closed doors or to the digital space. Afghan women refused to give up their right to live free and equal lives, and we are with them on this refusal. But they cannot do it alone. The international community must continue to in intentionally and directly invest in women's civil society and support the rebuilding of the Afghan women's movement. In two days, the Security Council will adopt a new mandate for the UN mission in Afghanistan. It is a litmus test of the Council's commitment on the rights of Afghan women and girls. The expectations of Afghan women are high. Over the past months, the Council invited six women from civil society to brief at its formal meetings. The women gave grim assessments of the situation on the ground, and they came to the Council with clear recommendations. They called for a strong mandate to monitor and report on human rights and to support the full, safe, equal, and meaningful participation of women across all processes. This week, not only the eyes of Afghan women and girls will be on the Security Council, the whole world will be looking at the Council to be accountable to the Afghani women and girls and to hold true to the commitments enshrined in Resolution 1325. I ask that the Security Council live up to its responsibility to do all it can and must to ensure inclusive and lasting peace and security for Afghanistan and its women and girls. I thank you. Thank you so much, um, Director Bahus. Uh, and I think your last words on the need for a very, very strong uh, mandate, a uh, Yanama mandate renewal, that hopefully is representative of the kinds of recommendations we heard here today from our panel. So big thanks to our co-hosts, co to our co-sponsors, and especially to our Afghan panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
So let's bring in uh, Petro Poroshenko then. Uh, yet again, another bombardment in Kiev, um, the city where you are suffering uh, deeply, um, former president. First of all, we have a very difficult 20 days, the most difficult in history of our country, maybe one of the most difficult in history of the world. Only this night, 12 missiles, cruise missiles, was attacking civilian object in Kiev, where we are now. It's happening just a few hundred meters from here, and definitely this is the changes of the Russian, Russian tactics. Because if before he want to keep the cities untouched and uh, make an uh, attempt to move further on Ukrainian territory, when Ukrainian armed forces, which we together created in a, starting from the year 2014, and I'm proud that uh, for the last eight years, including my presidency, we create one of the strongest and most efficient army in the world. We, we stopped the Russian army and the Russia pay a huge price by 13,000 Russian soldiers, which were uh, stay here forever. And uh, with the big numbers of the wounded and uh, uh, prisoners of war. And with this situation, I think that we should continue this uh, effective action from uh, Ukrainian army. And for these things, we need two uh, additional, uh, additional steps. Point number one, this is the second front. We are not waiting for the NATO troops, NATO soldiers, but we definitely need everything from nutrition to ammunition, from anti-aircraft to anti-tank. And uh, the Ukrainian army should have something to fight with the Russian soldiers. And it seems to me Churchill said that before the World War II, if you give me the tools, we do your job. This is exactly the same time, and that would be easy, understandable, mentioning your great prime minister. And uh, point number two, this is the situation for the land lease from the old NATO member states. We are ready to pay for that. We are ready to de lease that. But please deliver for us not only anti-tank and anti-aircraft, but jet fighters, especially the old Soviet jet fighters, MiG-29, which you don't need. And with that situation, we return the control. We don't need your pilot, but we return the control on the airspace. And that would be the cover for the nuclear power station. That would be the cover for c civilian object. And that would be the cover for the <laughs> Ukrainian troops which protect in Europe. Because you should understand, we fight not only for our soil. We fight for the democracy, for the freedom and for the West. And Putin is making aggression not against Ukraine. He makes an aggression in every single nation of the NATO, of Europe, and the history uh, of the free world is uh, being forged here in Ukraine right now. And with this situation, definitely. Mr. Poroshenko, we, but we, we were at a, a funeral today of four very senior officers, Ukrainian officers, who were killed in the attack, as you know, on the airbase in uh, Yavoriv uh, on Sunday. Uh, four very senior officers. How many more people are, w are you willing to sacrifice? How many more Ukrainian soldiers, militia, volunteers? You know, it, it, will you keep fighting? Point number one, exactly on this Yavoriv uh, Center for Security and Peacekeeping, I was with the leaders of United States, Great Britain, and uh, this is the uh, uh, just true in my heart. But this is the question for you: Is it? Do you understand that Ukraine do not uh, give up? And Ukraine will fight uh, forever until the victory. But please, we need that. That would be uh, our own job. And uh, my question, how many died? Just in Yavoriv, this is 37 people were killed by the Russian missiles attack. And this is happening in less than 20 miles from the NATO border. 
And that was a symbolic attack because exactly on this center for peacekeeping and security, which was established for the uh, very efficient symbol for the cooperation between Ukraine and NATO, which was open with my presence. Now, uh, the, it was under missiles attack of Russia. And this is the symbol that Putin never stopped on Ukraine. Putin go further. And this type of funeral of Ukrainian hero, Ukrainian hero who sacrificed their lives for uh, this, uh, uh, for the freedom and for the democracy, and more your support, less victim. Very simple arithmetic. And delay with your support means more victim, more blood, more lives of Ukrainian civilians, and more lives of Ukrainian soldiers. And you and Lviv understand what does it mean. You and Lviv understand how we surprise the world by our unity. From the 24th of February, we have now a completely different universe. And we also surprise the world by the, can I, can I the ask global you then, unity. On day, on day 20, when... Yeah, Mr. Poroshenko, we're nearly three weeks in, or your country is nearly three weeks into this war. Just briefly, if you can, do you have a better idea now than you did at the start what President Putin wants out of this? Oh. Please, don't trust Putin. Please, don't be afraid of Putin. Because Putin go as far as we together allow them to go. And if we will be strong and united, we stop Putin. If you find out a compromise with Putin, Putin go further. Today, he has a compromise for demanding Ukrainian Crimea or Ukrainian Donbass. Tomorrow, he will demand from the Great Britain, Scotland. Day after tomorrow, he will demand on the, from the United States, Alaska. Putin wants to destroy not only Ukraine, but the whole West, including UK and US. And the earlier we stop him, the more uh, uh, on the eastern flank of the Europe, that would be much cheaper price, which world will pay for the peace and security. Don't try to, to make a compromise with Putin, because that would be Munich in the year 1938. That time, Hitler uh, with the Chamberlain think that they deliver the peace. This is not working. Farmers, producers, scientists, community leaders, athletes or frontline workers, Ukrainian Canadians continue to make a tremendous contribution to our country. But the friendship between Canada and Ukraine is not only based on this shared history, it is also based on our shared values. Volodymyr, in the years I've known you, I've always thought of you as a champion for democracy. And now, democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion. Your courage and the courage of your people inspires us all. You're defending the right of Ukrainians to choose their own future. And in doing so, you're defending the values that form the pillars of all free democratic countries. Freedom, human rights, justice, 
truth, international order. These are the values you're risking your life for as you fight for Ukraine and Ukrainians. Beyond that, you're inspiring democracies and democratic leaders around the world to be more courageous, more united, and to fight harder for what we believe in. You remind us that friends are always stronger together. With allies and partners, we're imposing crippling sanctions to make sure Putin and his enablers in Russia and Belarus are held accountable. Today, in line with our European Union partners, I can announce that we have imposed severe sanctions on 15 new Russian officials, including government and military elites who are complicit in this illegal war. Le Canada. Canada will continue to support Ukraine with military equipment, as well as financial and humanitarian assistance. And we will be there to help rebuild once the aggressor is repelled. In Canada, we like to root for the underdog. We believe that when a cause is just and right, it will always prevail, no matter the size of the opponent. This doesn't mean it'll be easy. Ukrainians are already paying incalculable human costs. This illegal and unnecessary war is a grave mistake, and Putin must stop it now. Vladimir Putin's blatant disregard for human life is absolutely unacceptable. Canada continues to demand that Russia stop targeting civilians and end this unjustifiable war. Ukrainians are standing up to authoritarianism. And as parliamentarians united in this house today and all Canadians, we stand with you. As friends, you can count on our unwavering and steadfast support. And now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you all the President of Ukraine, our friend, Volodymyr Zelensky. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, dear Justin, members of the government, members of the parliament, all distinguished guests, friends, before I begin, I would like you to understand my feelings and feelings of all Ukrainians as far as it is possible. Our feelings over the last 20 days, 20 days of a full-scale aggression of Russian Federation after eight years of fighting in Donbass region. Can you only imagine? Imagine that on the on 4 a.m. each of you you start hearing bomb explosions, severe explosions. Justin, can you imagine hearing you, your children, hear all these severe explosions, bombing of airport, bombing of Ottawa airport, tens of other cities of your wonderful country. Can you imagine that? Cruise, cruise missiles, 
are being falling down on your territory. And your children are asking you what happened. And you are receiving the first news which infrastructure objects have been bombed and destroyed by Russian Federation. And you know how many people already died. Can you only imagine what words, how can you explain to your children that you just uh, full-scale aggression just happened in your country. You know that this is war to annihilate your state, your country. You know that this is the war to subjugate your people. And on second day, you receive uh, notifications that huge columns of military equipment are entering your country, crossing the border. They are entering small cities, they are giving siege, they are encircling cities, and, and they start to shell civil neighborhoods. They bomb school buildings, they destroyed kindergarten facilities, like in our city, city of Sumy, like in city of Ohtyrka. Imagine that someone is taking siege, laying siege to Vancouver. Can you just imagine them for a second? And all these people who are left in such city. And this is exactly the situation that our city of Mariupol is suffering right now. And they are left without heat or hydro, or without means of communicating, almost without food, without water, seeking shelter in bomb shelters. Dear Justin, Dear guests, can you imagine that every day you receive memorandums about the number of casualties, including among women and children? You've heard about the bombings. Currently we have 97 children that died during this war. Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. Of course, I don't wish this on anyone, but this is our reality in which we live. We have to contemplate, we have to see where the next bombing will take place. Uh, your church is square. We have a freedom square in the city of of in the city of Harden, our Babin Yar, the place where uh, uh, victims of Holocaust were buried, and they, they, it has been bombed by the Russians. Imagine that Canadian facilities have been bombed, similarly as our buildings and memorial places are being bombed. A number of families have died. Every night is a horrible night. Russians are shelling from all kinds of artillery, from tanks. They are hitting civilian infrastructure. They are hitting big buildings. Uh, can you imagine that there is a uh, fire starting at a nuclear power plant, and that's exactly what happened in our country. Each city that they are marching through, they are taking down Ukrainian flags. Can you imagine someone taking down your Canadian flags in Montreal and other Canadian cities? I know that you all support Ukraine. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio.